So now we're going to go on to a panel Q&A, and we have an eminent moderator, Mark McCarthy, who's an executive director of human genetics and a principal fellow at Genentech, also my former supervisor and mentor and friend, prior to joining... Still friend. Still, still friend. <laughs> not not What's that. that industry affiliation, you're, mo you're moderating <laughs> now. So now you're not here as my friend, you're here as a moderator. Prior to joining Genetech, Mark was a Robert Turner Professor of Diabetes Medicine at University of Oxford. And he, after moving to industry, applies the knowledge and insight that he has gathered from over three decades of research and clinical practice to deliver improved and novel strategies for target identification and validation risk stratification and biomarker discovery to help us bring new medicines to patients. Uh, so please take it away in the panel discussion, Mark. Very nice to be here. Thanks for those kind words. I, I think we're the, so we've got lots of options here. People can stand up and ask questions. I don't think there's microphone. Are there microphones? Or are they supposed to? Yeah, there are. Yeah, there are oh, there's the roving mics somewhere. Yeah. So if you want to ask a question in the room, you can. If you're online or if you're shy here, and you're shy, you can ask a question on Slido and I'll pick them up. I've also got some other questions here. I think we'll start, you know some of the um, people on this panel, if you've been paying attention this morning, but some of the people may be new to you. So I'm gonna ask Wei, Duncan, and Ida to introduce themselves briefly. Yeah. Yeah, hi everyone, uh, happy to be here. Uh, I'm a postdoc working with uh, Ben and Mark. Daly at Broad Institute and MGH. I have been leading the uh, analytical team for Global Biobank Meta Analysis Initiative that Ben has mentioned in his talk. And happy to answer any questions for GBMI. Hi, uh, I'm Duncan. I'm a statistical geneticist in Cecilia uh, Lindgren's group at the BDI uh, in Oxford, uh, over in the UK. Uh, and I'm helping lead the Brava analysis team and uh, as also Ben uh, mentioned in his talk and Brava is the biobank rare variant analysis I think add, Ben added network but um, with or without network on the end consortium <laughs> yeah and I'm uh, Ida Surakka originally from Finland so I know a lot about the Finchon project uh, but currently also a research investigator at the University of Michigan I'm the newest a uh, leadership person in the, in the GPMI after Kristen left for uh, industry, so that's that's why I'm here. Terrific. Okay. Well, whilst um, I've got not that many questions on Slido, and whilst people are not standing up to ask questions, I'm we haven't heard very much about GBMI, and we haven't heard very much about Brava at this meeting, and they're definitely part of on the agenda. So. Way, I'll ask you, and then I'll ask Duncan and uh, Ida uh, as well. Um, what are the key things that you need to propel GBMI forward, right? I mean, if you could ask for anything, what would you, what would you ask for? You've got all these funders, you've got pharma here, you've got academics. What, what, what do you need to propel GBMI to the next level? So, I guess we haven't got any funding, <laughs> so it's uh, simply a... Uh, you know, volunteer uh, work by all the biobanks. And we, uh, in the flagship project, we try to uh, prove that uh, different biobanks, although they're different, differ, they differ in so many aspects, and they can, the genetic association studies can be successfully integrated uh, in such collaborative uh, network. Uh, so I guess funding is the first thing we need. And then uh, we have shown that uh, the gen biobanks can work together to power our the genetic discoveries for human diseases in such a cost-effective way. And uh, we can study um, the human diseases simply link uh, EHRs to genetic data. And uh, we are uh, like we have successfully finished our round one, which. We have done flagship project and uh, uh, several subgroup uh, projects, and we have 18 publications that have been published or just on the way. And uh, we are currently doing round two projects, which uh, is slightly different from uh, round one that we have done essentially 
um, the meta-analysis. And in round two, we um, uh, biobanks are proposed by different research groups, and they are self-sustained. Uh, so uh, we have learned several lessons from the both rounds, and we're currently planning round three. And Ida can uh, provide more information uh, on that. And uh, yeah, we do need need resources and help. Yeah, absolutely. And um, for the for the round three, currently uh, we're obviously uh, looking forward to get more uh, biobanks involved into the GPMI. There's a lot of new phenotypes that we're very interested in to, to looking at, but obviously we're going towards uh, less common diseases. So to empower uh, study of those diseases, we do need more sample size, obviously. And then the other thing is the diversity. We want to increase the diversity. So we're calling every biobank here or online to approach us to join our effort. Um, and then the third biggest thing is, is, is kind of like going towards the longitudinal EHR information because that's the huge strength of these biobanks, having all the EHR information. Like how can we dive into the longitudinal data and, and get some new information from there? And Duncan, do you want to just say something about Brava? Same, same sort of, where are you and what, what's, what are the obstacles to going forward? Um, so I guess as with a lot of consortia, the kind of obstacles is like operationally it can be um, tricky. And in the case of Brava, you know, a lot of genetic data sets are massive, but when you start going to exomes and genomes, they become even more so. So, you know, given that that we don't have huge amounts of funding for this, sort of asking people to rerun things a lot of times can be expensive if we're not um, careful about that. Um, and I'd say as well, we're kind of now entering the age of like siloed um, massive data sets that all sit within trusted research environments or TREs that you kind of, if you've not heard that term yet, you will more and more uh, going forward. Uh, and we kind of have to uh, embrace that and try and develop federated approaches to enable us to analyze those data if we're going to be able to analyze them. Um, so we're working on that um, uh, in Brava and Way is very much involved with that. Um, and I think we're doing, um, doing a good job of kind of annotating the kind of consequences of variation is, is tough that Ben alluded to even with encoding variation. Uh, but we need to get better at that if we're going to kind of localize the, these causal associations. So the, the genes are out there, but we're, we're having a tough time finding them. Okay. We've got a question in the room over here. Yes. So, so, so coming back to biobanks and making them interoperable, what are the obstacles for making them interoperable, development of standards, as well as perhaps developing homomorphic encryption that would allow people access to primary data without necessarily compromising um, PII. Yeah, who would say that, Ben? Oh, uh, sure, you were sure. I, I, up I, I, have some, I have some thoughts. So, so, so I do worry about the homomorphic encryption piece because it dramatically increases the cost of the compute. And, and uh, like, even now, biobanks are struggling to get to a systematic analysis of their data set. I mean, the you know, very progressive ones that share their data in those environments you know, someone will kind of figure out a way to get through that every ICD code sort of analysis. Uh, the sort of value add of analyzing all the data jointly versus meta-analyzing sufficient summary statistics hasn't totally persuaded me uh, that that's worth the homomorphic encryption cost that you would incur to maintain security and privacy. And indeed, the you know people who are building these biobanks, in a lot of ways, are the ones that are best positioned to do the analysis and steward the data themselves, because they've been there from the beginning in terms of the construction and the building of those sorts of things. So, so I, I guess I'm still much more enthusiastic about either creating compute environments where people can engage with the data through protected access kinds of mechanisms like you're seeing for all of us or UK Biobank, as well as summary statistic or sufficient st statistic sharing to achieve the kind of combined anal analytic power rather than trying to 
add an even more complicated security infrastructure on top of the data sets, which also requires a huge amount of development for the analytics stack, right? Because it's not like you can just do that and then everything's fine. No, you have to like re-derive your methods and re-implement your pipelines to actually create that interoperability. So I, I think build the community, invest in the people at the places doing the work, and then you'll realize the vision of understanding as much as we possibly can about genetic variation. I mean, follow up about fair standards, and also when one does summary statistics, one needs to basically wait in a GWAS those summary statistics because you'll get a different result if you just. Yeah. So, so in terms of the, <clears throat> you know, interoperability question, that's where a lot of the like, kind of work that Wei did for GBMI like really comes to the fore, right? Because it was about here's the analytic pipelines that we think are sufficient that will ensure that the different data sets can be meta-analyzed and integrated together. So so I, I, I'm, I, I guess I, I try and ascribe to a, a less prescriptive model that says you must do this to a more kind of umbrella model of here are the things that we are okay with. And if you want to play with us, then you just got to do one of these three or four different pipelines and approaches. And that, I mean, like, that's exactly what we did in GBMI. That's the plan for, for Brava. And I think it does, you know, we know more about asthma genetics now because we did that. And so, so I think, you know, it's not, it's not the gold standard of fair, but I think that should not distract us from the scientific deliverable of learning about genetic variation as rapidly as possible. So I'm, okay, I'm going to move on because I've, mm -hmm. I've got other questions. I'm yeah, sure yeah, you okay, can sorry. pick this up. I'll come back to you in a minute. I've got some questions on Slido and I want quick answers from uh, folks. H how do you join Brava and GBMI as either a statistical geneticist or a biobank? Yeah, so we welcome uh, every biobank to join us and our, uh, we have a website called globalbiobankmeta.org and uh, you can just directly email us or fill out the contact form. And uh, we don't have very specific standard for biobanks to join us, but uh, roughly we try to um, uh, prioritize the uh, underrepresented uh, groups. So um, and in biobank with sample size over 10,000 uh, for European ancestry samples or 5,000 for non-European ancestry samples are uh, welcome to join us. For Brava? Yep. Um, we've also got a website. I've just Googled um, Brava Genetics and our Twitter comes up, so it shouldn't be too difficult to find. Uh, and on there, there's a, a, an email address that you can just email calling out for people that are interested in, uh, in joining. Related question also from Anonymous um, outside. Um, how do you select phenotypes to analyze and propel? Um, for, for Brava, we uh, had a, a spreadsheet open to everyone uh, on the calls and, nom and asked people to nominate phenotypes that they're interested in, in studying and want to um, send out to the group more broadly. Uh, and we're sort of taking that list and finding out how many samples are in there to, to filter down to a, an analyzable list. Okay. Yeah. And something similar for GBMI. Yeah, for GBMI in our flagship project, we uh, we have calls and meetings with all of the biobanks together. We carefully selected 14 endpoints based on common interests, uh, including both common diseases and less prevalent diseases. And also, of course, based on the sufficient sample sizes in biobanks and try to use this exemplary um, endpoints to demonstrate the benefits, challenges in biobank meta-analysis. And then in round two, which is ongoing, um, the phenotypes are, as we uh, see, the projects are uh, driven by different research groups. So uh, research groups can, nom can study any phenotypes they are interested in. And uh, in, yeah, we're still planning our in round three. So we expect we can add more phenotypes uh, that are of interest of researchers and also as well as time to even phenotypes based on longitudinal EHRs. Um, I have so many questions for this amazing lineup of speakers, but I'll just ask one about statistical methods. Um, 
Uh, what are the areas of, uh, what are the biggest areas of need, do you think? And I'd be happy to hear from um, any of the speakers about uh, what do you think the biggest areas are that we need new statistical methods and that we don't have um, adequate methods right now. Anybody want to answer that one before I pick somebody? Go on, you, down the end, you can start. Yeah. Andres, yeah. Can I go? I think I have the mic yeah. open, right? Uh, I mean, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer, of course, from the perspective of, of the mixture of ancestries in, 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 in admix genomes. And this applies not only for Latin America. There are many populations in the world that would benefit from knowing what is the contribution of differential effects that are linked to the ancestry at the local level of each variant that, you know, can be mapped in a given population is not transferred to whatever effect has in another one. And this is particularly complex in the context of admixed genomes. And there's a whole area that needs to be improved in understanding which is uh, the contribution of each of these ancestries in the outcome. And this goes for PR scores, for example, and it goes for mechanistic effects, it goes for EQTLs, for single cell uh, gene, gene expression profiling. It really applies to all the uh, levels that ICDA wants to tackle, and I think it's one of the major areas that once data is available, methods should follow to be developed on that. Do you want to add something, Ben? You might have thought about this once or twice. Yeah, uh, I would say I'm still very worried about fine mapping and co-localization. I think, you know, there's clear gaps between what the algorithms say that the accuracy is and what the empirical accuracy is, and that seems quite concerning to me. Um, it may be a data problem as much as an algorithm problem, you know, other kinds of variation being called and captured. And indeed, I think there's a lot of scope for thinking about haplotype aware methods, thinking about multi-allelic variants and all of the non-SNP variation that is out there that we've sort of become blinkered to um, as a consequence of working with SNP chips and GWAS and just how kind of easy and reliable it is to work in that space, that, that, that kind of diversity is really good. And then the last thing I'd add is family methods. I think there's a huge amount of value to be gained from trying to probe questions of genetic contribution and heritability, leveraging familial relationships at different kinds of degrees. And those methods are pretty limited. And I think there's also like scope for development and innovation in how you think about that kind of contribution to variants. Yeah. And then highly regularly, you want to answer the question as well. And you're not even on the panel. I, I'm just going to throw in my hat and say, I think better causality inference, uh, especially in a multimodal data setting. I think is really key and not sort of present at the moment and especially given a lot of biases in you know data collection data structures and so forth so I think causality in France would get a vote from me as well thank you okay we've got one two three that's a uh, four actually that's uh that's pretty good we've only got 10 minutes so look, I think this hand was up first oh okay okay oh well uh, Carolyn <laughs> My hand was up before. So. Okay, I, I couldn't see. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think I've sort of changed my question a little bit based on where the discussion's gone from when my hand was before, but it's building a little bit off of Ben's point and then tying it into the question, you know, how do you get to the more complex variation? And then I think tying it into the question of how do you balance the wanting to use EHRs and then wanting to get into diverse populations where you were sort of describing you don't have these EHR systems to sort of work on that. And so I'm trying to decide in these projects, when do you think about sort of going for the less low hanging fruit and what is the direction you think is the best way to move for that? I can see, you know, I understand the initial focus on where it is, but of the multitude of ways you could go deeper or to the harder problem, which ones do you think right now you'd want to prioritize? Is that a question for Admix Map or for anybody? It's for anyone who wants to answer it. I'm going to start with the Ricardo and Andres, though. Ricardo, do you want to answer that? Uh, can I go ahead? Yeah, you can go ahead. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think I would answer with a multiple phase approach, right? I agree with you, Caroline, that has to be moving from the, from the long hanger fruit in those places, which is why I tried to answer earlier, those locations that have some intermediate level of accessibility of the data that is ready to go right away to the next level. I want to highlight the example of Costa Rica, which I think in Latin America is probably the only country that has really a centralized national uh, uh, digital system of, of, of health records. So, so it, apart from that, I mean, maybe Brazil is also kind of close to that. 
but I don't think it's a national level system. I mean, of course, it's a way smaller country, which is easier to do. But I think right there, there's a big opportunity to uh, leverage that, 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 that information that has been already centralized together with genomic information that, by the way, has already been um, at least uh, collected in, in, a, in a survey that it's a collection that is ready to be um, um, uh, mined. That's kind of an example that I think would start with an easy uh, example. Um, all the more complex situations are like the one that um, uh, Ricardo gave an example from Chile, but already is in place in terms of the prospective uh, recruitment capacity. Mexico has the capacity to become prospective. The, the biobank that I presented is, is not prospective yet, but it will become, that's part of the proposal that we have in Admix Map to become a prospective cohort that will involve investing in the follow-up capacity of those individuals. So I think there's different levels and different potentials, but I think at least those three examples would be a great point to start, like you know, uh, Mexico, Chile, Costa Rica, for example. And, and by the way, with different phenotypes available, and this is also answering a previous question that what phenotypes you have available, which I know it can be very vague to say, hey, we just need you know, more data, more, uh, you know, scale this up, but which specific questions can be answered will depend on which phenotype is available. And I, it's also different bit, bit depending on each site. Uh, Mexico has a high focus on metabolic uh, disorder traits, and that, that, that's what is really uh, feasible to keep collecting. Costa Rica, for example, the cohort that I mentioned, I think I, I, I didn't clarify that, it's uh, one of the largest um, worldwide uh, studies on, the, uh, on VPH. So, so, so uh, the, the VPH infection, actually, the, even the vaccine against VPH has been developed in collaboration with this Costa Rican team, and we have close connection with them within Latin genomes, and that has a, a very good potential to be connected with uh, uh, cervical cancer research. In Chile, though, it's mostly focused, like Ricardo explained, in COVID and all the related phenotypes. So it may vary as well between countries which phenotype can be focused on. Okay. I'd like to get a couple more questions in because um, I didn't see who was here. You, you, uh, yeah, here, if we can. Then there. Why don't we ask those three questions and then we'll, you, you, and somebody over there, first of all. Thank you to all the speakers. It's been a really exciting session. Uh, I have this question more addressed to the underrepresented population in the UK, in the biobanks in general. Uh, because as, as Ricardo and Andres, they mentioned already, I think there's a lack of funding in the context of Latin America, but it's not only Latin America, it's also Africa and Asian countries. So how is the ICD going to contribute to scientists like them that they, they, they struggle in, in the context of Latin America because it's infrastructure, the politics, and also there's many things that are not comparable to Europe. So how ICDA and how this is going to help them to organize the data and then also put it into the into this platform because of course getting 5,000 people is, is not easy. So my, my question is more in the context of how are you going to help them and also other ancestries? I can go. Yeah, go on, okay. Ricardo. Well, I, I, be, being here is already helping us and uh, we, we are really grateful for this opportunity to be speaking to you all now. And uh, I think that the way forward is a change of para parady paradigm, where uh, Afri uh, that this already happened in Africa. Going from the helicopter science to go there and, and grab samples and then never come back uh, after publication. So this is what we want to happen in Latin America. And this is what we are proposing, a, 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 a circle of research where discoveries go back to communities, to government uh, officials, so that we show them the results, we show them the value of doing this type of research, we show people that it's important to participate. There is a lot of mistrust, distrust or mis mistrust, um, on participating in genomic studies in Latin America because of uh, a long history of, uh, of, uh, of um, you know, um, 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 abuse of one ethnic group over the other ethnic group. And so all industrialization, scientific knowledge, everything is associated with, with European uh, culture. And, 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 and so there is a, a mistrust on participating in, in international efforts or even, even local efforts. So that, in order to change, there has to be a, a, a close relationship between local scientists, international scientists, and local communities so that the, the, the research process can be circular and continuous. And, and that will help us to gain trust from local governments, uh, also uh, so that there are 
private-public partnerships where we have international funding, local funding, private funding, all work, working together towards a common goal. And, and, and that's what we, we, we need to be able to demonstrate to everyone, to the larger society, that this is not for someone to get rich at the expense of poor people, but this is something that is needed in order for improving health for everyone. And that's, I think, this is the, the biggest challenge. And for that, we need to work together. Well said. Um, I think it was over there. Do you still have your question? And then that'll probably be the last one. So we haven't got to everybody. And apologies to those online that we haven't got to all the questions. Hi, thank you very much. A really interesting morning. I'm uh, Lisa Strug from the University of Toronto and the Hospital for Sick Children. So we're really interested in um, um, calling and analyzing and connecting alternative variations like st structural variations, variable number of tandem repeats. So I'm really curious for the biobanks and, and Brava if there's a plan to address alternative variations and um, as well as accounting for phase and whether you think the focus on biologic variation has left a lot of discoveries on the table. Yeah. Go for it, Duncan. You can do it. Yeah. Um, as has been said before, we're sort of addressing the low-hanging fruit first, but certainly have plans to look, in the first instance, at the phase um, question. And, you know, recent methods have, have popped up in the literature talking about being able to phase rare variation using exome data coupled with genotyping. And we're considering that in, in Cecilia's group and elsewhere as well as a, a first thing that we could start looking at. But uh, as of yet, no um, plans for the more kind of complex variation but we would welcome people to, to come forward with projects to, to put forward to, to pursue within Brava, certainly. Okay, I think we'll have to draw for a close there because I'm sure everybody's anxious to get to lunch. I would like to thank all those who've asked questions. I'd like to thank the panel. And since you know who they are, if you didn't get to ask your questions and it's cold and rainy outside, they're going to be trapped here for the next 36 hours. So I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure you'll find a chance to catch up with them. Thanks, everyone. And uh, uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.